Welcome to the Heart Health Summit. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Menelcino, Certified Functional Medicine Practitioner and Director of the Mental Clinic Center for Functional Medicine in beautiful Jackson Hole. Thank you for joining us, and this is your opportunity to hear from international experts to provide optimal heart health for yourself, but also to help you achieve optimal vitality. Today, we have Dr. Kat Toops joining us. Thank you so much for joining us, Kat. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks, Mark. Well, let me brag a little bit about you to our viewers today. And, and Kat's someone I've known for many years. She's one of the leaders in integrative functional medicine. She's got a burgeoning practice. And she's really someone that I think you'll enjoy listening to today. Dr. Kat Toops is the functional medicine psychiatrist at the Bay Area Wellness in Walnut Creek, California, and the organizer administrative administrator for the Bay Area Functional Medicine Group since 2012. She's a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, board certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, and previously boarded in geriatric psychiatry. She's active in local psychiatric associations. She was on the board of trustees for the California Psychiatric Society, served as a counselor at large, and co-founder member of the NCPS Integrative Psychiatry Steering Committee. She's very active in the East Bay Psychiatric Association, serving on the Board of Trustees from 2006 to 2012, and as president from 2009 to 2012. Dr. Toops is a former assistant professor of psychiatry at UC Davis. She was inpatient residency training director, and later the owner and medical director of the Bay Area Research Institute, which was a clinical trial center in Lafayette, California. She served as principal investigator for over 100 clinical trials over 12 years, including 12 in Alzheimer's medications. She's found that the elusive cure for brain psychiatric illness may not be found in a pill, and I'm excited to hear more <laughs> of her thoughts on that. She personally embarked on an intensive course of study to learn functional nutritional medicine and was one of the early completers of the Institute for Functional Medicine Certification in 2013. She's a certified practitioner by the Institute for Functional Medicine. Dr. Toops practices functional medicine psychiatry, which seeks to discover the underlying causes of inflammation, which may be diet, nutrition, lifestyle, genetics, including MTHFR, which she'll talk about, food allergies, dysbiosis, gut health, toxin exposure, and chronic infections, including biochemical abnormalities. These can all be contributors to psychiatric symptoms and cognitive difficulties, Detection and correction of these problems can result in the resolution of psychiatric symptoms rather than just proving a Band-Aid by prescribing psychiatric medicines. She really searches for the underlying cause, and she works with people from all aspects of health challenges, and her niche of the psychiatric and medication understanding allows her to provide a more functional nutrition base. Again, thank you so much, Dr. <laughs> Kat Toops, for joining us today. Thanks. That was quite a, quite a long intro, a romp, a romp through the past. <laughs> well, you deserve it because you've worked hard to get to where you've at, and this isn't something you learned in medical school. Um, yeah. I know you've shared with me that you've had a personal journey, and a lot of people in nutritional, functional, integrative medicine have kind of a personal story. Could I ask you if you'd share that with us? Of course. Well, um, you know, lately I've been focusing my practice on working with dementia and reversing cognitive decline. And I came to functional medicine because of my own uh, um, brush or bout with dementia. Um, probably when I was about 50 years old, I, I was doing clinical trials. I, I actually have done 20 clinical trials with Alzheimer's and mild cognitive wow. impairment. And I was testing my patients and I came to realize that I was as cognitively impaired as some of my patients. And I would do a mini mental status exam where I had to give them three words to remember and I couldn't remember the words myself. And I had used that test for more than 20 years. So I had two sets of words I alternated with and I would have to write them down to ask my patient. <laughs> Um, but what had happened was I had developed multiple chemical sensitivity. I got allergic to absolutely everything. I was covered with rashes, covered with hives, had severe chronic fatigue, couldn't get out of a chair for a year. And all of that inflammation in my body was ravaging my body, but it was eating up my brain. And the, the brain function just got worse and worse. I mean, it, it's nobody thinks of dementia in somebody that's 50 years old, but, um, I knew enough to know that I actually have treated patients with dementia in their 50s and it goes very rapidly. So it's mm -hmm. quite a different 
critter than late onset dementia that occurs after 65. Um, I got to where I couldn't drive a car safely. I, I could no longer back up or parallel park the car. I just, my brain couldn't sequence those things. I couldn't use a computer um, very well. I couldn't remember how to do things that I used to know how to do. And I would ask my husband how to, sh how to do something and he would get mad at me because he said, I just showed you that. And I couldn't remember that he had mm -hmm. showed me that. Wow. I, I, I developed trouble hearing and, and I, I couldn't understand what was being said. I kept going to the ENT and saying, I need hearing aids. And they would test me and say, well, you just have a mild hearing loss. You don't need hearing aids. And one day the, the, doctor looked at me funny and he said, you know, it's not in your ear, it's in your brain. And I had developed an auditory processing problem. And so I couldn't decode what was being said when there was muffled or um, background noise. Um, so it, um, all, all what kinds a scary of things time. happening. What a scary and, time. Kat. And you know, it's, um, I mean, at the time I wasn't thinking in terms of dementia. I wasn't thinking that my processing was impaired and, you know, that my visual spatial sequencing was impaired. I, I was just trying to survive every day. So that is actually how I came to learn functional medicine. Um, I went to a conference called Food is Medicine and it just totally blew my mind and opened, you know, this whole new type of possibilities of, of actually helping people get really well Mm -hmm. Instead of just managing an illness, because the type of illness I had, I would be drooling in a nursing home by now, you know, if I hadn't have learned functional medicine and, and got my brain back online. Well, I'm sure in your psychiatry residency, they taught you quite a bit about nutrition. <laughs> yeah, like zero, right. You know, Joel Kahn told us that in the cardiology boards, there's no questions on nutrition and there's no training in nutrition because there's wow. no questions on the board exam. So. And we wow. really had to learn this on your own, didn't you? Well, and it's the same thing with the GI doctors. And, you know, um, in the course of learning things and developing several autoimmune illnesses before I got well, um, I went to the, the GI doctor and, you know, was having an acute problem from taking some metal out of my mouth. And, and I said, well, do you think this could be related to my gluten allergies and the GI doctor said, I don't know anything about food allergies. I don't deal with that. So yeah, it's, it, um, it's changing, thankfully, right? Lots, 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 and lots of people are coming to the table and, and understanding the importance of functional and nutritional medicine and how we really can, you know, halt disease and even reverse disease. You know, I had an interesting conversation with Dr. Rupi of the Doctor's Kitchen, who uh, practices in London, and he was asked to speak to the medical students at Bristol and do a uh -huh. cooking class, which is exciting. And, yeah. and I think more students are wanting nutrition, and they're pushing the universities, the medical schools, to add more nutrition classes. So I wow. think that the, the new generation of doctors realize that nutrition is important. How are you able to implement this? Are you using health coaches? Are you doing one-to-one? -one? Are there longer visits? How do you really break that barrier to let food be medicine? Yeah. Um, and I have a nutrition health coach that um, when my patients come to see me, they, um, they see me and then they also see the health coach to get started on the diet. I, I'm pretty fortunate here in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's mm -hmm. a lot of awareness of nutrition and many people actually come in on very good diets. So it's quite different in other parts of the country where people aren't so aware of nutrition. And so for many people, they're already eating a clean diet, but then sometimes it's fine tuning it to their metabolic needs, right? Do they have heart disease? Do they have lipid problems? Do they have high hypertension? Do they have obesity? You know, what's their blood sugar control? And then, um, you know, and working with the dementia and cognitive patients, there's so much benefit of the diet for um, cognition. And I'm sure you have a lot of people that come to you on different diets or they've tried different things. How do you try to kind of clear the slate for them and get to a, a starting point that allows them to start actually building? Is there a core plan that you start people on or is everyone start at a different point? How do you, how do you assess well, yeah. where to start? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you know, in order to get an appointment to see me, people complete a questionnaire because I, I always have, a, you know, a long wait list. And one of the questions is, are you willing to undertake radical dietary and lifestyle changes? Because if you're not, forget it. You know, I mean, you know, 
if you want to get well, you have to start with the diet. That's the foundation of everything. And, you know, the purpose of, of your summit here is to deal with, you know, heart and cardiovascular issues. And of course, the root of that is inflammation. And inflammation is the root of all chronic illness, right? And so how do we begin to control inflammation? The very first part that we all have control of is what we put in our mouth. So the food can be inflammatory or can be anti-inflammatory. So for my purposes, I ask all my patients to stop gluten. Um, I know you're aware of this, but you know gluten is the most inflammatory thing we eat, and, and we it's it's been hybridized to have higher and higher gluten content that destroys the lining of our gut and promotes leaky gut. And the gluten, of course, is the first thing because it's causing the leaky gut. It gets through, you know, into the bloodstream and calls out the troops to kill that invader. So it's a very inflammatory food. It also has got a super high glycemic index. So the gluten is 20% higher sugar than table sugar. And people say, well, I don't eat white bread. I eat wheat bread. Well, the wheat (laughs) bread is a higher glycemic index than the white bread. So, (laughs) excuse me. Um, So the, um, you know, the first place to start with is um, uh, even before the gluten issue is, of course, are you eating processed food? You know, we need people to eat real food. We need to eat whole food in its natural form. We don't want all the additives and preservatives and the nutrients killed in our food. Um, we need to avoid the toxins in the food. And, you know, that's a, a whole nother can of worms. But um, all of the genetically modified food and the pesticides and the toxins, as I test people for toxins, um, it's just ubiquitous. Um, yes. In the in the, I test all of my patients um, with that that come in with cognitive decline and dementia for many many things. But when I test the toxins, every single person is high in Roundup or glyphosate. Even kids, even young people. It's it's just it's. I, I mean, I've eaten organic food for almost 20 years, <laughs> and I have eaten religiously organic since 2009 when I got very sick, and I was in the yellow zone. Yes. In, you know, it's still there. Yeah. We were talking to Joe Pizzorno the other day about this and the half-life of some of these chemicals is decades. So as yourself mentioned, you, you go yeah. completely organic. It just takes a long time for these toxins to, to leave the body. Yeah. And you're right. The kids are really our front line of concern because they're getting exposed to these all the time. How, how do you help women understand about this concept of what's in their food and how to make good choices are there some simple rules or some simple places where they can start? Um, I, th- I think the, you know, the easiest place is to, to start to, you know, the typical teaching of shop around the outside of the grocery yeah. store, you know, the vegetables and the fruits and the meat and the chicken and the fish and, and avoid all the processed stuff. I mean, I think so much of our decline came with the health of our, certainly our nation here in the 1960s when we got hamburger helper and processed foods in a box, you know, and (laughs) it seemed like it was a useful thing. I mean, when I was um, pregnant, I thought eating lean cuisine frozen food was healthy, (laughs) you know, and I mean, we've just, we've been sold all of this incorrect advice. So some of it is just trying to help people understand that First off, just start with simple, real food. And, and it, when you stop eating stuff with so much sugar, I mean, the sugar, of course, is a, is a huge drug for people. And, um, and, it, and it's so hard for many people to stop the sugar. Um, but once you get past the hump and your microbiome changes very rapidly when you eliminate gluten, you eliminate sugar, and, and then people hit a point where it's gone they don't crave it and I I know for me if I eat out at a restaurant I'm very sensitive to when they put sugar in food because my taste buds don't want it anymore Um, I'm sure probably every person listening right now say cat how do I stop my sugar cravings yes how do I do it do you have any do you have any simple solutions or ways they can start yeah 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 um I was the biggest carb junkie imaginable (laughs) And my doctor in college, I was a sugar junkie before that, and I was having problems with getting headaches, and it was from low blood sugar. I would eat a candy bar, and then I would get, my blood sugar would crash, and I'd get a headache. So the doctor said, quit eating candy, uh, candy, sugar, Cokes, whatever. Okay, so I'm a good patient. 
I quit all of that and I started eating bread. <laughs> you know, I'd go to the cafeteria in college and I'd get a salad and six dinner rolls. So I was a huge carb junkie. And what really helped me to get off of my carbs was glutamine. So glutamine is a simple amino acid. It's in all of our food. Um, we often use it in functional medicine for gut healing. So it, it's the fuel source for the, the lining of the small intestine. And, and it really promotes gut healing, but it helps sugar and carb cravings. And it's so easy to just, you, you, you know, the, the capsules come in 500 milligrams. You can take two of them as soon as you wake up. You want to take it on an empty stomach because if you take it with your food, the effects just get lost. So you can pop two when you wake up. And then you can pop a couple between breakfast and lunch, and then a couple between lunch and dinner, and then a couple, you know, at bedtime if you need it. And it really does help those cravings. And after a while, then people find they suddenly, you know, start decreasing needing it. But but that can help. I mean, there's there's other underlying issues with the sugar. Some people need to have gut testing if you have yeast overgrowth or parasites in your gut. They thrive on sugar, and so sometimes people are doing a great job eliminating sugar and then they'll feel like a switch went off in their brain and they just got to have sugar and they're going through the cabinets. Oh, there's this old box of Jello. That Jello probably has some sugar in it. You know, they have to eat sugar. And those are the critters of the yeast or the parasites saying, feed me, feed me. So sometimes, um, you know, exploring if, if you're really having trouble doing stool testing and finding out what is happening in there and addressing that will also really help with the sugar. And then there's tricks. Okay. There's, there's wonderful um, snacks available. I mean, I give my patients a list of a couple of chocolate alternatives. Um, Go Raw is a line of food that mm -hmm. they sell at Whole Foods and Thrive Market. And they have something called Choco Crunch. And it's coconut chips covered with dark chocolate cacao. So there's no dairy. And I think if you ate the whole bag, it's about three grams of sugar. So, you know, there's, there's little snacks and tricks and things that you can do where you're actually eating something healthy, but it's feeding those sweet taste buds. Okay, I love that hint about the coconut and cacao. Can you give us a couple other hints or pearls of that you've found that help with that sugar craving? Some yeah, yeah. So that same line, Go Raw, they also make coconut chips with lime on them. So they're just crunchy coconut chips, chips with a little bit of tart lime um, uh, flavor, and um, they're healthy, so they're healthy fats. So I know we want to talk some about fats for the heart and the brain, um, but um, you know, coconut, of course, is, a, is an easily assimilable, assimilatable fat, mm -hmm. and um, so you could eat this whole bag and you're actually giving yourself nice healthy fats but it feeds the sugar cravings. Well, you're talking about sugar feeding those little yeasties. And I don't think yeah. a lot of people really understand what this whole concept of yeast in the gut and how that ties to inflammation and heart disease. Yeah. How do you, how do you use an easy way to explain that to your clients? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, yeah, yeast is fairly ubiquitous. Most of us have some amount of yeast in, in our GI system. Um, and the problem, of course, is when it overgrows. So we have a balance of all this different life within in us and, and many of those critters, as I call them, but the microbiome, they, they help us to extract nutrients and the good ones help to outcompete invaders. And so we need to keep things in a balance, but they're easily disrupted um, certainly by what we eat. They're also disrupted by stress. I mean, stress alone <laughs> causes leaky gut and all kinds of problems in the gut. So um, working with the balance in the gut and the, the health of that is important for the purposes of the heart, the inflammation in the heart, and my purposes for the brain. Of course, the heart and the brain are connected. And um, so I, I think it's just a just it's important for people to understand that the health of our gut is controlling everything in our body. Um, it's the place that we always start in functional medicine. What are you eating and what is your gut health? Um, because if you don't get that right, um, you're not going to be able to control the inflammation and all the chronic diseases everywhere else. Well, you talk about the heart brain connection and I, I think a lot of people don't really realize, uh, and we were taught in medical school, there's separate boxes hidden from each other and they never really communicate. Right. And the gut never communicates with the heart. Right. How do you see that interplay? Is there a, again, an easy way to help us to understand that relationship a little bit better? Everything is interconnected. And it's been a 
crime of medicine that, that we've compartmentalized things. And yes, we need specialists that really know everything about a particular area, but we have to always put it in the context of everything is interconnected. Psychiatry has been the worst of it, right? Yes, this is yes. what psychiatrists deal with. And no, the problems in your brain can't be from what's happening in your gut or what's happening with your lipids or what's happening with your blood sugar or what's happening with your infections, which turns out to be a huge driver of things happening in the brain. And some of the infections that affect the brain also affect the heart. So we know that Lyme is one of those, um, one of those infections that can affect so many systems in our body. One of my friends had Lyme for 10, 15 years. She was very, very ill. Both of her children were born with it. And she was finally diagnosed because she developed this heart murmur that could be heard across the room. They said, when did you have, what, how long have you had this murmur? She said, I don't have a murmur. Well, the Lyme had affected her heart and that's how she was finally diagnosed. But wow. Lyme also has a predilection for the brain and it's turned out to be such a big driver of psychiatric illness and dementia as well. So it, it definitely is important for all physicians to start to understand the interrelatedness of everything in the body. And you for a psychiatrist, it, I mean, it's a steep climb when you come to learn functional medicine. You have to learn about the gut and the lipids and the blood sugar and things that, you know, we had long forgotten with our residency training. You know, we didn't deal with that in residency at all. Um, but it, it's, um, it's a problem, especially for women. Let's come to our topic here of women. Um, so, you know, women with heart disease are often missed, right? Yes. Because what people think, okay, if this is a woman, they're not going to have this risk for heart disease, and people don't take that seriously. And it's, it's the same, same thing for psychiatric illnesses that are due to medical illnesses. So many women are told, well, this is from your stress, you know, you're, you know it's, you're, and even if you have a gut problem, well, it's from your stress, go to the psychiatrist. I have so many people that come to the psychiatrist. They say, whatever it takes to fix me, but the problem is in the body. And it's, you know, and, and back to our notion of inflammation, because that links the brain, the heart, and all of our systems in the body. Well, you know, you're so right. I, I was taught the brain was a black box and it didn't communicate with the rest of the body. And, <laughs> you know, in medicine, we've gone back, we've gone to this Rene Descartes simplistic reductionist approach to break everything into the smallest piece so we can understand right. it. Right. And what you're really doing is going back to the systems approach and putting all the relationships back together. And I, I think f for me to hear a psychiatrist thinking that way is really exciting because it's, you're really allowing your expertise of the brain to tie it to the heart and tie it to the gut, tie it to infections. And the work you do with chronic infections, I think is probably the least understood in medicine. It's not how we're taught about infections. You take an antibiotic and everything's better. Right. Um, you mentioned Lyme in the heart. Right. There's a, a, an arrhythmia problem called third degree heart block where your heart stops um, communicating with the top and lower part. And one of the few things that can cause that is Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. So we, we know that infections in the heart are, are really leading to major serious illnesses. What about some of these obscure infections? You talk about candida, you mentioned Lyme. What are some of the new ones on the radar for you that may tie heart disease to a chronic infection, chronic inflammation? Well, I think any kind of infection causes inflammation because when we have an infection, our immune system activates to fight the infection. Well, how does an immune system fight an infection? Well, it's releasing inflammatory cytokines, right? Chemicals to kill the invaders. But anytime there's chronic inflammation that's going on, you know, over periods of time, like some of these infections, um, that damages things. So it's going to damage the blood vessels and, you know, it's going to damage the brain and it's going to, da I mean, you, you, it can damage everything. So, so any kind of infection in the inflammation that it creates is a problem. Now, what we're seeing, you know, in the last decade or so is we're seeing a proliferation of, of autoimmune diseases. Right, we're seeing more and more immune diseases, and coming with that is then the immune system's out of whack, which means you're more likely to succumb to some of these chronic infections. Yes. So Epstein Barr is another one that we see quite a bit, 
Um, I don't really know how Epstein-Barr affects the heart, but it certainly affects the brain and the cognition. And Epstein-Barr is mononucleosis or chronic fatigue. And actually, a huge percentage of us have had some form of that by the time we're 18. Like many, many viruses we get in childhood, the viruses now we know continue to live in our body, but in times of stress or times of impaired immunity, those viruses can wake up and reactivate. So um, reactivated Epstein-Marr is something that we see a lot, and it's quite an inflammatory disease. And um, it, it would be interesting to know how it affects the heart. Do you know? Does it? Well, you know, it's interesting because they, they found in blockages or plaques that cause sudden death in both men and women mm -hmm. when they do DNA or molecular analysis of that blood clot heart plug they find the DNA of chlamydia and Epstein-Barr, and they, they find a lot, and fungal infections. Yeah. They yeah. find remnants of these infectious processes actually in the plaque that caused the heart attack. So I, I think you're right. And we know in the brain that these infections are, are at bay. I think we're just beginning to understand it. And your, your analogy of this inflammatory process, this fire on the brain, fire in the heart, fire in the gut, mm -hmm. once the fire's lit, it affects all aspects of the body. And, right. you know, I, I love how you've always taught me this relationship of the immune system, inflammation and infection, and, and the in, inflammation can just run rampant. Are, are there strategies where, uh, if you don't mind, number one, how you identify inflammation and then how you address it? Not, I know it's <laughs> never a one size fits all, but there must right. be some basic things that, that you start with to start putting out that fire. Right. Well, I mean, the first step is what is causing the fire. So obviously that's going to be quite different for different people. So when you see somebody initially, yeah, start with the diet. There's basic nutrients that people can and should take that are anti-inflammatory. Um, fish oil is, you know, one, of course, that I'm sure is covered in your talks here. I mean, fish oil is, is, is a very powerful anti-inflammatory. And um, sometimes I'll have people take super high doses of fish oil, especially when they're having depression, anxiety, memory problems. I have a, a protocol that I call fish oil jump start. And <laughs> basically, idea. well, Great and idea. it's interesting. So I have I people it. basically take eight grams a day for the first week and then step it down and end up at three grams a day. So, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I have like the dosing of the fish oil I like. And so basically you take four twice a day for a week, three twice a day for a week, two twice a day, Oh, well, what is it now? Five, four, three, two. You yeah. end up at two twice a day, which is about three grams. And, and I think three grams is a basic healthy dose for, for most people. It's interesting in the psychiatric literature, we learned a yeah. long time ago that fish oil could help depression. Mm -hmm. And the, the studies back then were to use eight grams a day. Well, it's hard to keep taking eight grams a day of fish oil, right? There I was just going to ask you that. I've tried it. It's hard. <laughs> it's a lot of, a lot of, nobody wants to take that. Um, but recently, and so we all said, oh, you could probably get by with less. And so we, we gave less. But, but what I noticed when I have people start with that jumpstart, it floods their brain and people can have rapid reduction in their depression and anxiety. But I think that once you repatriate and get those levels up, you can taper down and then stay, you know, at a tonic level without having to take the high dose. But a recent paper came out um, that was a meta-analysis of all of the studies with fish oil and depression and anxiety, and they all showed eight grams as pretty much the therapeutic dose. But I, but I do think that they were short-term studies, and so I do think that once you get the levels up, you can maintain them without having to stay on that high a dose. So fish oil, you know, great for the heart, great for the brain, great for, you know, so many things in, in the system. So that's a very wonderful and easy anti-inflammatory that can be started at the first visit and then changing the diet. But beyond that, it, you have to personalize it through the testing. And there's just so many different factors for different people. So um, to use dementia as an example, because that's where I've been focusing lately on, you know, working with people with dementia and mild cognitive impairment and how can we stop that and hopefully reverse it. Well, dementia, they're going down fast. So I have to test everything up front. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the criticisms of functional medicine is, well, they, they do too much testing. But if you don't test, you're not going to find the answers. So some people are easy. You can make easy interventions and they're going to be okay. But when you have a very complex 
disorder like dementia, um, there's multiple factors. There's never just one thing that's driving that dementia. I often find multiple things. And so if we want to, you know, stop the decline of dementia, we've got to fix all of those things. And so, you know, what I find, uh, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of people talking about dementia, change the diet, you know, exercise every day. We know exercise changes the heart. It changes the brain. That's our best and, you know, cheapest, and, you know, for, for absolutely anything. Um, but, you know, change your diet, exercise, do brain training, take some supplements. And with dementia, that's not enough. It's where you start, and it's where you start with any chronic disease, right? Any of the kind of conditions that we're trying to deal with, immune disorders, lipid disorders, blood sugar disorders. Um, but, but then we look farther, and the big areas that I think people are missing are the toxins, mm -hmm. the infections, and the lack of hormones. And I think we should maybe jump into a little bit about hormones because they have great implications for the heart and the brain as well. Um, you know, with, with hormones, um, well, women, our risk for heart disease is much lower than men until we go through menopause. And then it starts to approach the risk that men have. So hormones are protective for the heart. And that, that is pretty clearly known. But they're also protective for the brain. And we have receptors for all of the, the traditional sex hormones in our brain, right? Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, pregnenolone, and both genders have all of those receptors. Well, I recently learned that the brain actually makes its own estrogen. It does. Mm -hmm. And it makes its own progesterone as well. And so we should have some protection from, with our brains once our gonads stop producing those hormones, but what we're seeing in things like cognitive decline and dementia is that things are disrupting the production of those hormones in the brain, and those are the infections and toxins. But, but working with the hormones then, um, you know, and, and supporting people's hormone levels in the, the menopause transition and after menopause um, is, is just turning out to be magical for, for both the memory, the cognition, you know, and also for protecting the heart. So, Kay, you're talking about hormones for women and mm -hmm. are the synthetic hormones doing mm -hmm. the same thing as what this estrogen the brain makes? And and how do you differentiate between the different type of hormones that women can take? Do you yeah, have any yeah. recommendations? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so definitely the older hormones that have been around for, I don't know what, 40, 50 years, um, the Premarin and Provera that many women took and had problems with, we do not recommend those hormones. So they are not what are considered bioidentical. They're not in the same form that our body makes them. And, and they do have increased risk for cancer and strokes. So um, the, the big thing with estrogen, well, with both estrogen and progesterone and testosterone, we want to have them in a bioidentical form. So we want to have them in the same form our body makes it. If you split hairs, you could say they are still synthetic because they're being synthesized, but it's yes. We're honoring the form that our body makes them. Um, for the estrogen, it's critical that people use it transdermally through the skin. So if they take estrogen orally, even the trochies, I have people that go to integrative GYNs and they come into me and they're taking estrogen trochi, which is a, a hard thing that you suck on and you're supposed to absorb it through your gum. You still swallow. You make saliva, you swallow. You're still taking that estrogen orally. And what happens with oral estrogen is it goes through the, the liver and breaks down the first pass through the liver, has metabolites that can cause cancer. So we want to be sure that when we talk about um, hormones, that's a great point, is that we want to stress that with estrogen in particular, we want to give that through the skin so it does not go to the liver and make those harmful metabolites. And it's very interesting that um, more and more data is coming out all the time now that, um, that even in women who've had breast cancer, the big fear is, oh, we can't give hormones because it's going to cause breast cancer. Well, the hormones don't cause the cancer, but if you have a cancer, it can feed the cancer, but they don't cause it. And there's actually data coming out that, that, that it, they're protective, that there's actually a lower incidence of recurrence in women who have had breast cancer that are being treated with bioidentical hormones. So it's- yeah. um, We've had that, several speakers talk, about. talk about these hormones, Kat, that how mm -hmm. by taking bioidenticals, you may occupy the receptors that the synthetic or xenoestrogens from our environment 
may actually be causing trouble. And, and that's an interesting hypothesis that by protecting yourself with bioidenticals, you may be preventing the, the toxic environmental estrogens. That's really interesting. I hadn't heard that, but it makes perfect sense to me. Well, we're, yeah. we're seeing young girls go into uh, menarche earlier, having their periods earlier. Right. Uh, you know, we're just seeing these, these changes right. in our kids too. And it's got to be driven by something. And it may be the toxic food, the toxic environment and all that. As far as if I'm listening and I want to try to get clean or try to detoxify, are there some simple things I can do at home to try to help get that process started? Um, detoxify. Can you be more specific? Just a, well, in general, a general, a general detox. Yeah. There are, are there some simple rules that, that might again, help people get started. And then I'm going to ask you a couple harder questions after that. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people have a lot of different programs with detox. I think our bodies are actually meant and designed to cleanse themselves. Mm, so I the first that. part to me is that, you know, if we quit putting in talk, things that's that's the number one thing you can detox and then if you go back to your lifestyle and eat horribly and put chemicals on your skin and your lotions you know you're, you're going to remain toxic so first you have to take a hard look at what are you eating what chemicals are you using in your house for cleaning and your laundry and and what do you put on your skin with your lotions and your makeup and things like that um, but but yes our bodies are designed to be self-cleansing I mean we've learned that the brain does that now when we sleep and um, the glymphatics, which is part of the lymphatic system that can drain toxins in our body, um, they're called the glymphatics in the brain. And when we sleep, the, the, the cerebrospinal fluid and the ventricles starts expanding and churning around like a washing machine. And supposedly, it's, it's taking the toxins out of the brain and, and cleansing our brain. So sleep, let's just mention sleep here. Please, please. It's, it's the important. hardest thing for people to get a handle on is their sleep. So at the very least, to, well, I mean, to, to, to have it work is one thing, but just even the notion that, that we've got to protect those eight hours of sleep and six hours of sleep doesn't, you know, people say, I'm fine, I can do it, but you're depriving your brain at least of that time to detoxify. Great point. So, so Great you know, point. The, the sleep is critical. So, you know, I, I try to avoid having people have to, there's already so many things that you have to take when you're sick and <laughs> And to have to have, you know, to me, fancy programs for detox. I mean, they're great. People can do that and feel great. Some people do coffee enemas. They feel wonderful. Um, I think sweating is, is the ultimate detoxifier. And that's what we use when people have high levels of chemicals in their body, right? We recommend sauna. And there's very nice data that shows that, um, you know, regular sauna will take those chemicals out of your body. And there's a beautiful study that came out of Finland um, in this past year. That, that showed that the men who did sauna every single day had a very low incidence of Alzheimer's. And, and the men who did it three times a week had a higher incidence. And the people who didn't do it at all, you know, higher still. So all of the native traditions of sweating, um, it, it, that's an easy and inexpensive thing that people can do. I love that kind of ancient wisdom that, that have been born of tradition that actually we're finding their scientific evidence for. Yeah. And uh, it makes it really exciting to do it. You, know, you were talking about omega-3s, and I talk about all of us as we're all fatheads in the omega-3. Yeah. I love your idea of, uh, of dosing up in the beginning and then bringing yeah. things down. And I think a lot of nutrients, maybe we, we underdose them a little bit. And that's an interesting perspective of sometimes you have to fill up the tank and then you can bring it down. Yeah. Are there yeah. supplements you see that benefit with? I think glutamine may be that way too, or... Um, sometimes I underdose it and a little bit more on the front end ends up being better than we can taper it down. Right, right. No, and glutamine, I mean, there, there's data for using very high doses, like in the ICU, that people will recover much better. You know, I think it's, you know, 20 grams, 30 grams, I mean, very high doses. Um, so, you know, it depends on the level of illness that people have. But yes, if you're going to take something, you want to take enough to move the needle and make it worthwhile. The omega-3s are so easy to measure now. We can measure mm -hmm. them at Quest. We can measure them at LabCorp. We can measure them at True Health. So, you know, I, I, I get a level as part of my screening and I look at the omega-3, omega-6 ratios and I tell people I want to see those omega three levels at the top of the range and I want to see the omega threes in the bottom half of the range, you know, because I mean, I'm sorry, the omega sixes mm -hmm. because they're pro-inflammatory and we need to have them 
but you know we need to have the balance right on those things and are most people you see when you do the testing very low in their omega-3s it seems like everybody's low in vitamin d and in omega-3s when i test them right you can sort of predict it and i have my Mm. patients come in with a three-day food diary so before I see them, I review their three-day food diary, and it's so illustrative of what kind of, you know, things that am I going to find in the testing. Um, so I do live in an environment where people are a little more health conscious, um, but I definitely see people that, that are low. And but Dr. Toops, I eat farm-raised salmon every night. How come my omega-3s are low? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, it, but it's it's very easy. That's omegas are a very easy thing to fix, even even if you can't change the diet. Like I personally do not like seafood. I grew up in southern Louisiana. I'm an anomaly <laughs> because we had all of this wonderful fresh seafood, but it would come live and it would get thrown in the boiling water and die. And I just was too tenderhearted and I could never eat it. So I have to take fish oil because I'm not going to be you know getting it from that aspect of my diet. Um, so yeah, well, the fish oil is an easy thing, easy thing though to to dial in there. Well, um, I'm I'm fascinated by how many people come in with bad fish oil, where they'll they'll come in. Everybody brings their supplements to look at them, and they'll hold them out away from themselves and open it because it's it's got such a bad smell to it. And yeah. a lot of the fish oil they're rancid before they even take it. So. Oh, and that um, I had a I had a patient tell me that the, you know a brand that I've used for years and have had hundreds of patients take. She's like, I'm not going to take that stuff. It's rancid. I said, Well, where did you get it? Well, she bought it on Amazon. And as you all know, and you know, having quality control of the supplements is critical. We need to be sure that the supplements are free of toxins, and we need to be sure that they're stored properly. Mm -hmm. And so it it is a problem that way. I wanted to talk a little bit about the fat and the ApoE4 gene. Please. Um, Because you you had me thinking about the fat. So the ApoE4 gene is, is related to Alzheimer's, and it's a risk factor for Alzheimer's. Um, I don't like my patients with dementia to eat, to worry about, Uh, risk factor for Alzheimer's because we can change that. But it's a big risk factor for cardiovascular Mm -hmm. factors. And so the ApoE4 gene is such an interesting interesting allele. So we have ApoE2, 3, and 4. I have no idea what happened to the 1. I could (laughs) never have researched that. What happened to ApoE1? But but ApoE4 was... um, Actually, it was um, a mutation that happened when we separated from primates. Mm -hmm. So when we came out of the trees and became homo sapiens, the ApoE4 evolved. And it's a pro-inflammatory gene. And we needed that inflammation to protect us. So when we get hurt, when we get caught, when we get sick, we need that inflammatory response of our body to help resolve the problem. And so that inflammatory gene was useful to protect early man. And early man didn't live much past 30, 35. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have to suffer from chronic inflammation that then kills our blood vessels and our heart and our brain. So the people that, that still have the ApoE4 Um, gene, it's considered a fat bucket gene. That's what it's kind of fondly or not so fondly (laughs) called. So people that have the E4 gene, what's useful for me to know is that these are people that are going to tend to store their dietary fats in their blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And so people that have the ApoE4, it's just useful to know that you need to watch the types of fats that you're eating and keep keep an eye on your lipids and what's happening. So with, um, with dementia, we're often using a ketogenic diet because it's so helpful to shift from burning the carbs and the sugar into burning your fats. And those ketone bodies really help the brain and the clarity of the brain thinking. But we have to watch it in people with E4 to make sure that doing a ketogenic diet involves basically you're eating primarily super high fat and super low carb. And then, uh, you know, a, a more moderate amount of protein. Um, And so pouring in all those fats, even when they're healthy fats, if you have an E4, you can potentially elevate your lipids in the long haul. But it doesn't always happen. So some people say you should never do ketosis with somebody with ApoE4. 
And that doesn't turn out to be true. So, you know, it's something that I will start with people, but, you know, after two or three months, I'm going to check their lipids and check their advanced lipid particles and see what's happening there. And I've seen it go both ways. Some people will elevate and other people will actually lower their lipids on a ketogenic diet. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, you definitely have, have a higher risk for heart disease, but you can modify that risk by what are you eating and the types of fat you're eating and, and keeping an eye on those lipids. You took a difficult topic, uh, um, this APOE4, and you explained it beautifully. And I remember when I first test, I, I had a patient come in 25 years ago with their positive APOE4 test, scared to death, right. and we didn't know what to do with it. I had nothing really right. to help them. And right. I, I hear you lecture to doctors and talk about genetics and how you incorporate them in your clinic. You're not doomed to be your genes. You have the ability to alter their expression. Yes. And right. that's, a, that's a big part of your practice, isn't it? Well, it's yours and mine, right? It's it's important for all our systems, the epigenetic factors. So, you know, we all have genes. And what's amazing about our genetics is there's all kinds of redundancies and protection in our genetic code. So one gene may cause something to go this way, but another one may cause it to go that way. And so ultimately, things should work in our biochemistry if we don't mess up the works. And so you know, what's happening with, you know, some of these diseases blowing up. I mean, Alzheimer's is going through the roof right now, and it's going to more than double in the next 20 years. And it's already, I don't know, something like 6 million people here in the U.S. I, they, the statistics from the Alzheimer's Association says like every 66 seconds right now, somebody is diagnosed, and it's going to go down to like every 20-something seconds. And so, you know, things are changing, but but it comes to the toxins in our world, right? How come looking at the beautiful view behind you of, you know, <laughs> that pristine mountain range, but how do we protect our world from all of the toxins? And they're going exponentially right now. And all of these things are gumming up the works. So these are factors. And, and so we may think we're eating healthy food, you know, and, and people have to get educated about the food they're eating, right? Is, is this, you know, food that's been grown with pesticides um, you know, because those things are going to accumulate in your body and those are going to turn on genes that weren't meant to be turned on and then things will, will get the undesirable outcome. So, yeah, I think the exciting thing is really that we do have the power mm -hmm. to not have these genes turn on in a bad way. And, and once they're turned on, we do have some locus of control to get them back in. And my own story was a great example I mean, it, you know, from where I was and to have my brain come back online, but I had to work through everything, all, everything I learned in functional medicine, every module I learned, I had to apply those things to myself. You know, my genetics were issues, my toxins were issues, my gut was an issue, everything was an issue. Hormones, I mean, it occurred when I was going through the menopause transition. So, so you know, there's, there's a lot of factors, um, but, but I think, you know, the beauty is that some of it, is not that hard to mm -hmm. do, well, you know, if you get it before you're really sick. Well, you've, you've had to walk the walk and you talk the talk and I know mm -hmm. you personally and you, you live it now and in your mm -hmm. choices and yeah. you really are a role model example to fellow doctors and to your, to your patients. And I think that's very powerful, your personal story, but also how you make your decisions now. And that's, uh, you learn things on a daily basis that help you, that you're able to share with your clients. And I think that that's very powerful medicine. Well, I think that's a, and also an excellent point is that the way I live is a lifestyle. I didn't do something to get well and then go back to yeah. the way it was. And that is a frustrating thing because we all see patients who get better and then they slack off and they say, well, I needed my comfort food because such and such crisis was happening in my life. And I mean, I've seen cancers come back that we put into remission because somebody needed their comfort food. And, and, and so there's, there's really great food. I mean, I, I don't need any grains. You know, I, I don't need any dairy. I don't need any soy. I mean, I still have, a, there's a lot of food to eat. 
you know, people say, well, yeah. what can I eat? Well, definitely work with a nutrition health coach if you have trouble figuring out what to eat because there's lots to eat. And I mean, I travel and these days it's become quite a lot easier to follow a good diet and travel. When I first started on this path, it was not easy. So people are getting more aware of, of you know, options with gluten and dairy and, and things like that. But yeah, the point of you're, you're in it for the long haul. You know, this is how you protect your health. You know, exercise. I mean, you 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 know, over fifty, you 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 fall off the curve if you don't keep up with your exercise. You know, I used to be able to go two weeks without exercise, no problem, could jump back in. You know, so um, you know, definitely the notion of of all of the things that we've talked about. How can you get peace and try to make it reasonable? Yeah, that's often the goal, yes. right? I mean, I don't want people to have to be taking supplements four times a day. And sometimes in the beginning, they have to when they're sick, and we're working on things. But then it's like, okay, how can we simplify it? And, and how can we make this lifestyle sustainable so that you don't feel like you're struggling to eat right and exercise and get your meditation in? I mean, meditation is a great example for the heart and the brain. Um, you know, we know that 12 minutes a day of meditation can change your brain, but they don't have to be all at once. You don't have to sit in a lotus position for 12 minutes and meditate. So you could spend three or four minutes when you first wake up in the bed, and you could spend three or four minutes before you go to sleep, and you could have, you know, three or four minutes another time in the day, and you're going to get those benefits. How can you bring little periods of mindfulness, little periods where you just, you know, mindfulness is if you shut off your brain and you come into your body. And just be aware. So you can go on a walk in nature and don't bring your cell phone and listen to the birds and smell the smells. And that's a little meditation. So a lot of it is how can you figure out how to incorporate these things into your life that work for you, that don't feel like you're having to struggle so hard to stay healthy. Well, you know, Kat, that's such a great message. And, and you talk about exercise. It's easier to stay in shape than it is to get in shape. So <laughs> yes. uh, to be there and to lose it. But yeah. you know, you're such a great example. And I mean, for everyone viewing, you're a board certified, award winning psychiatrist. And it's hard for you to do it on your own. So you need some help. You need to find an expert like Dr. Toops. You need to find a team that can support you. Uh, family, friends, get this kind of whole pack available, get this group mentality, do it with a friend, but you need to seek out expertise to help get you started in the right way. So Kat, if people wanted to connect with you or to learn more about the work you're doing, how do they find you? What are some of the things you're excited about? Uh, please share with us what's, what's new in your world and how we can connect with you. Yeah, great. Well, my passion right now is working with dementia and trying to, you know, both prevent it and especially that when people are suffering, how do we figure out what's driving that dementia. So I've talked at a lot of places and got a sense of where doctors are struggling and, and how to do that and, you know, monitor with patients and patient groups. And so I'm writing a book right now called Dementia Demystified, and it's, it's going to be a how-to manual. So it will be targeted to both patients and physicians or clinicians because I want the patients to be able to take the information to their physicians. I mean, there is a, a huge amount of labs and disorders that we need to look at, and I've spent a lot of time putting together the chapter on what is a laboratory workup? Where do you get it? What are the codes? What does it cost? What if you don't have insurance? So I'm trying to make a very practical guide so that people can um, know what to do because there's many books that are great books out that will talk about how you, you know, the diet, the exercise, the meditation, the brain training. So I am trying to take it further and especially highlight the effects of the toxins and the infections and the hormones that pe people are missing. Are you so, telling me that dementia is reversible? It's reversible. I'm proof oh. of that. <laughs> It's proof. And, and, you know, we can see this in the head scans. Now we do the volumetric head scans and we can image all the structures of the brain. And when I did that some years ago, my gray matter was somewhere below the 20% level. It should be at the 50% level. And now it's close to the 50% level. So wow. we can see um, when working with all these factors, we have quantitative measures. We can see the brain change. We can do neuropsych testing. We can see the parameters change. So I'm not going to sit here and say all dementia is reversible. It's just, but if it's not, we haven't found the cause. 
or, you know, either the physician or the patient hasn't tried hard enough. But we're definitely making great, great strides at, at identifying all, all of those factors. Well, so, D, Dean Ornish taught us that heart disease is reversible, right? which is the biggest killer of women. Right. Now the biggest fear of women of getting dementia may be reversible in people. That's very well, exciting news. And they're linked, right? The same Absolutely. factors that are causing the heart disease are causing the brain disease. And, you know, I mean, vascular is huge to both, right? We've long known about vascular dementia, but, you know, it's a mixed bag. I mean, I use the term sometimes Alzheimer's, which is a specific type of dementia, but there's so many types of dementia. And usually it's a mishmash of several types. So we have to seek out in our testing and find that out. But but really the message I want to say to people is, is that dementia is not a death sentence. And, you know, that if you are having cognitive decline, there you, you should try to partner with somebody that can help you. Dr. Dale Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's, is a wonderful book, you know, that that describes this t- type of methodology that we're using now. Um, I've had the good fortune to work with him, and we're um, hopefully going to be starting a prospective clinical trial um, using his methods as soon as we get our IRB approval. <laughs> through but um but yes dementia is not a death sentence and when you feel like you're having cognitive decline you are i mean there's a there's a term that's called subject subjective cognitive decline and you know people know when something's happening they know and and typically for women it's it is i mean the menopause transition is huge i i recall when i um I started having premenstrual migraines that were not like my usual migraines and I was having word finding difficulty and I was in my early forties then and I went to my doctor and she said, Oh, welcome to perimenopause. She said, (laughs) word finding difficulty is pathic mnemonic of perimenopause, meaning it's a hallmark of perimenopause. And so I went home and I thought, Oh, okay. I'm in perimenopause. No problem. And then I started thinking, okay, 50% of women are going to get Alzheimer's and maybe the 50% that get Alzheimer's are the ones that start having problems when they get into perimenopause. So, you know, fast forward to all that we know now, there's a whole body of data, huge files of papers showing the effects of the hormones on the brain. So I would say, if you feel like your memory is slipping, your cognition is changing, it's time to investigate. Don't wait until 10 years later when your brain is really a mess. Um, yeah, and my, and my would say, check your heart, check your brain, and mm-hmm. give Dr. Toops mm-hmm. a call. <laughs> is there a place they can find you on the internet or in Facebook or Twitter? Yes, um, Dementia Demystified is the name of my book. So that will link you to my website and I'll have updates there. The book is still in progress. I keep finding more and more things that need to go in it. Um, But um, yeah, Dementia Demystified or my name, you'll find it there. And then I also have a a Facebook site um, that's, uh, let's see, what is it called? Uh, Cat Tubes MD-Functional Medicine and Dementia. And I try to post um, interesting articles and I try to post positive articles about the brain not all the doom and gloom I'm really trying to to look for things that are interesting about how our brain works and how we can treat things and reverse things there well I'm going to go look at it tonight because I'm excited about the work that you're doing Uh, Dr. Kat Toops thank you so much for being with us today and I look forward to seeing you again oh likewise thank you so much thanks for getting all these messages out for women it's so important thank you